Animals display a great diversity in their body plans. And when we talk about body plans, we're talking about uh, morphological characteristics. And we're also talking about developmental things. So as we go through and start talking about these body plans, keep both of those in mind. And we're just introducing them in this chapter and we'll discuss them more as we get to the organisms or the specific phyla that display these characteristics. One thing that's very important when we start talking about body plans is symmetry. And so how symmetric is the organism or what type of symmetry do they have? There are a few animal groups that have no symmetry at all. So those would be what we would call asymmetric. But other than those, we have two main types of symmetry. The first one is what we call radial symmetry. And that's what you see in this picture, or both of these pictures that are shown here. And with radial symmetry, we have a top that is distinctively different from the bottom. Okay, so we have um, a flower pot here. We know the top of the pot is different from the bottom of the pot. Or if you have an organism like an anemone, the top is clearly different from the bottom of it. Now, if we take and we cut them um, down as you see these planes in this diagram, we can't really distinguish between a right side and a left side or a front and a back. So with radial symmetry, there's really just two different sides to it, the top and the bottom. That was the first body plan uh, or type of symmetry to evolve. After that, we ended up with what we call bilateral symmetry. And bilateral, you have the top and the bottom and the top we're going to call the dorsal, and then you have the bottom, which we will call the ventral. And in addition to this, you also have some other symmetry there. So we have a top and a bottom, but we also have a front and a back. So if you look at this um, crustacean here, this shrimp, you have the head end and you also have the rear end. So the head or the front is what we would call the anterior. And then the back is what we're gonna call the posterior. Okay, so really three types of symmetry. We can have no symmetry at all, or what we call asymmetric. And then we have radial symmetry and we have bilateral symmetry. As humans, we would be bilaterally symmetric because we do have the top and the bottom and we also have the anterior and the posterior side. If we move on to talk about tissue organization, when we're saying tissues, we're talking about specialized cells which tend to in some way be isolated or separated from other specialized cells. So many times these specialized cells are enclosed in some type of a membrane structure. And so these can be specialized cells for muscle development. These could be for the nervous system. This really all comes from the gastrulation process. So once we have the layering start taking place in the embryo, we can start to have specialized tissues. Okay, so tissue organization is due to gastrulation. And that whole process of gastrulation gives us a couple different types of tissues or a couple different layers of tissues. So ectoderm, ecto means outside, and endo means inside. But if we look at what this means, we start with a hollow cell, which is the blastula, and then with infolding, this is going to end up folding in like this. The outside is where you would have the ectoderm. That ectoderm is characteristically responsible for the development of the body wall. So this would be the outside of the organism. The inside, this is the endoderm, and the endoderm tends to develop into the digestive tract, or at least the beginnings of the digestive tract. We can have different um, types of organisms. We can classify them as diploblastic, 
And with diplo, that means two, they have two layers. So that would be the endoderm and the ectoderm, as we've just mentioned. But we can also have what's called triploblastic. So triplo, triplo obviously means three. So in that case, we're gonna have yet another layer. And that third layer is what we call the mesoderm or the mesoderm. The mesoderm is in the middle. And so this would be tissue that develops inside or in between the ectoderm and the endoderm. And that's going to be responsible for developing into a lot of other structures inside um, the animals. If we talk about body cavities, body cavities are fluid or air filled um, compartments. And this is going to be between the ecto and the endoderm. Or in other words, this is going to be between the body wall and the digestive tract. So this is some kind of air filled or open space inside the organism. We can classify organisms depending on the presence of the body cavity or what the structure of the body cavity is. Now this body cavity is something that's going to be unique to the triploblastic organisms. So to start off, we can have what we call a true coelom. And coelom, that is the true body cavity. So to be a true coelom, this needs to be developed from mesoderm tissue. And in this picture, the mesoderm is being shown in red. So this is going to be lined by the mesoderm. And these are what we call coelomate organisms. Coelomate organisms have a true coelom, meaning that they have one that has formed completely from mesoderm tissue. Now we can also have what's called a pseudocelum, and these would be pseudocelomate. organisms. And so this is something that's formed a little bit different. This one is formed from both mesoderm and endoderm together, but it's still going to be this empty cavity or by empty, it's not tissue filled, but it may have fluid there. It's still a cavity inside the organism that's going to separate the digestive tract from the body wall. This is something that we will see characteristic in a number of animal types. And then lastly, we have what's called um, acelomate. And the acelomate ones don't have any type of body cavity at all. And so in this case, they're, they're just solid. So it's solid tissue, solid cells. There is no hollow cavity developed from the mesoderm or the endoderm in that case. Now, if we talk about functions, there are some benefits to having this body cavity. So one of the functions would be that it's going to cushion everything. So this would cushion any organs that are inside the body cavity um, from being squished. So if we press on our bellies, we have organs that can kind of just move out of the way. So that's what we're talking about here with the cushioning. We can also have independent um, growth, and then also movement of the organs that happen to be inside that coelom or body cavity. Think about our intestines. They're able to move to digest food, and on the outside, we don't even kind of realize anything much is happening inside there because the fluid that's in the coelom is going to cushion us, and we're not going to even notice that because the intestine is able to move on its own. Another thing for some groups is that it can be a type of skeleton. So if this is really filled full of water, it's going to provide some support for the organism. So we do have some advantages to having that body cavity there. If you haven't noticed already, animals, um, human animals or chordates, the ones with the backbones, those are going to be the ones that have the true coelom. So we're gonna be coelomate organisms. We'll talk about that characteristic more when we get to the chapters where we talk about organisms or animals that are coelomates. 
We can have two different groups of organisms if we divide them based on their development processes. So we have the protostomes and then we also have the deuterostomes. And if we go through and talk about some of the main differences between these two, the first difference that we see is in the process of cleavage. So if we look at the protostomes, which is shown in the blue picture here, their cleavage is going to be spiral. And what we mean by spiral cleavage is that the plane of cell division is going to be at an, a diagonal. So it's a diagonal plane of division, and the end result of this is that we end up with cells that are different sizes when we look at that eight cell stage. Notice that we've got some smaller cells and we've got some larger cells. Typically you've got small cells on the top and larger cells on the bottom. So we can already start to see some differences there. Another thing is that they're going to be determinant. And what we mean by determinant is that the fate of the cells is determined early. So if you were to take some of these cells at this H eight cell stage and you were to try to grow them, each one of those cells is not going to be able to develop into a full-fledged embryo because it's already been decided for them what part of the body they are going to develop into. If we look at the deuterostomes for comparison, their cell division is going to be radial. The radial means that the planes of cell division are either parallel or perpendicular to the axis. And this will give us cells that are roughly the same size as each other. So it's a more organized cell mass. Notice that these lines will line up with each other, which is not something that we had when we looked over on the other side. And we also have indeterminate um, fates. So this means that these cells, in this case, are going to retain their capacity to do anything. This is really stem cells. So they're able to then, if you were to take some of them, harvest them, and put them in an environment where you could grow them and they could undergo division, each one of those eight cells could divide into a full-fledged embryo. We can also talk about difference in the coelom formation. On the protostome side, you have solid masses of mesoderm that will develop on either side of that endoderm tissue. So the endoderm in this case is being shown in yellow. So that would be the endo. And then the blue would be your ectoderm. And so you've got solid masses and the coelom would then develop right there from those solid masses that formed on either side. If we're looking at the deuterostome side, the coelom is going to be little buds that come off of the endo endoderm. So you're actually forming the mesoderm from the endoderm itself. If we move on and talk about the blastopore and what happens with the blastopore, Eventually, the blastopore is going to develop into two separate openings. And these openings tend to become the mouth and the anus of the organism. When you look at this, in both of these, the blastopore started, that first folding in starts at the bottom. So this is really where the name of protostome and deuterostome comes from. Proto means first and deuterostome means second, and stome means mouth. Okay, so with the protostome's first mouth, that means the first opening that we have from the blastopore forms the mouth, and then the second opening would form the anus. If we're talking about the deuterostomes, the second opening would form the mouth. So notice that it's up here on the top now is where our mouth is, and the anus is going to be the first opening that developed. If we look at what all this means for animal phylogeny, just like we had with earlier groups, and as we talked about a bit with the protist, animal phylogeny is not something that's been written in stone. So this is something that does change quite a bit. You can never look at a textbook with regards to phylogenetic groupings and consider that to be fact something that's written in stone. So this is constantly being kind of shuffled around. Um, it used to be that all animal groups were really based on morphological data, so how they compared visually to each other. 
And nowadays we have more um, molecular data available. And so when you start putting that molecular data in there, it does shuffle things around quite a bit. To date, there's about 30 animal phyla that are recognized. Again, give or take a few, because this is always changing. And if we compare the two, there's a number of things that they all do agree on, all the different trees. So first of all, all of them share a common ancestor. So animals are thought to all share a common ancestor. And so when you look at the trees, phylogenetic trees, they are going to be rooted trees. This is something that morphological data shows and also the molecular data shows. Another thing that all the trees agree on is the fact that sponges are basal animals. And what we mean by basal animals is that these are going to be animals that evolved very early in evolutionary time. So these are your primitive animals would be another way to say it. Another one is that the eumetazoa or eumetazoans those will be a clade with true tissues. And we'll talk about the eumetazoans more. We have also that most animal phyla are going to fall into bilateria. So this includes most animals. Bilateria is going to have that bilateral symmetry that we mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So these would be organisms that have a top, a bottom, and a front, and a back. And then lastly, the chordates and some others form the clade deuterostomia. Okay, so all animal phylogenetic trees kind of have these basic things in agreement. Other than that, they do differ some. So if we just compare um, two different trees, the first one on this side will be based on morphological data. On this side, it's based on molecular data. And the two trees are very similar to each other. They are both rooted trees and it is going to be a colonial flagellated um, protist that's thought to have given rise to these two groups. We talked about the coanoflagellates being responsible for that. And they both have the sponges, which is gonna be this porifera group, as the basal or most primitive group, the group that branched off the earliest. After that, they do change a bit. Notice that all of the other animals fall into this eumetazoa. Remember, that's the one with the true tissues. And that's on both sides of this. And then after that, we have um, some differences. Those differences will go into what they mean in later chapters as we start to talk about the individual animal phyla. But just note that when we're over here with the molecular data, we don't even recognize that protostomia group anymore. That is going to be split into the Lophotrochozoa and the Ectozoa groups.